Sam Cedar, Emma Vigland on the Majority Report. It's a pleasure to welcome to the program Mindy Iser, labor writer based in Philadelphia. Uh, Mindy, uh, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, you have a piece um, uh, that uh, in these times, uh, writing about the UAW endorsing a ceasefire, uh, the largest U.S. union to call for an immediate end to the violence in uh, in the conflict uh, between Israel and really uh, Gaza, I guess, or the uh, war. Um, what uh, uh, give us a sense of like what led up to that? Yeah, I think a lot has led to this moment, a lot of internal work in the union um, that maybe many don't know about. So uh, there's a um, reform caucus in the UAW called UAWD um, that fought really hard to institute a one member, one vote um, situation. So members could directly elect the leaders of their union. And they won that. And so this past union election for new leadership was a one member, one vote um, election. And Sean Fain, who's now the current president, ran um, with the support of UAWD. He ran as a reformer and uh, he was running against the incumbent Ray Curry. He won very, very narrowly. It went to a runoff um, and he ended up winning by 500 votes. And basically right after um, taking office, he went into um, bargaining with the big three, essentially. There was a big convention to uh, meet about uh, bargaining priorities for the big three. And then they started bargaining. And then, of course, they had the historic stand up strike, which was the first time that workers at all of the big three companies were out on strike at the same time, um, which was huge, I think very disorienting for the auto industry. And I think it was a really different thing than they were used to. Obviously the UAW has been mired in corruption and you know deals with um, previous UAW leadership. And Sean Payne took a totally different tone. Um, people might remember that uh, he like didn't shake hands with the uh, big three CEOs um, like it, his predecessors did at the start of bargaining because he wanted to show that he was really there representing his members. It was adversarial, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't all kumbaya. Um, and then after 40 days on strike, they did uh, win historic contracts for the big three. And then right after that, they pivoted to announcing that they were going to um, launch campaigns at all of the non-union auto um, factories around the country with the goal of organizing 150,000 uh, non-union auto workers. And then they announced that they were supporting a ceasefire. So yes, it's been a huge banner year for the UAW, and it's very exciting to see what is going to come next for them. What, what I find fascinating about uh, this this story is that we're seeing the implications of process and how it implicates uh, goals and uh, strategy, um, because we're seeing the shift, <clears throat> that one shift, which on its face just looks like a different way of electing leadership, uh, and which, which one I think seems obvious to people um, where each person gets to vote as opposed to like a slate, uh, you know, uh, electing a committee to, to provide a slate. This ends up changing the nature of the unionism that's being practiced. Can you talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's completely right. It's a totally different orientation to what a union is, what it can be and who um, who the union is and who it's for. I think there's been, you know, an old school mentality in a lot of unions um, that our job is just basically we're an insurance policy for workers. We help them keep their jobs. We help maintain the status quo. We help maintain wages and benefits. And of course, all of that stuff is important. Job security, wages and benefits. Of course, of course, of course, bargaining is so important. But unions used to be and I think can be and will be again, uh, a home for the working class, a source of struggle for the working class, a place where workers can actually um, experience democracy, um, be part of a democratic process and feel powerful and feel like 
they are the people who make this world possible, run the world, and they are and they do. And you can see this reflected in the communications coming out of the UAW. I don't know if um, people listening saw their most recent video about their new campaign to um, organize non, non-union auto workers, but it's all about workers who you know are in the frame and they put up their hands and they say, these hands punched the clock, these hands built the cars, these hands like built our country and we're gonna be the ones to make the decision about our future. And I think Sean Fain, the way he is leading the union, it's not just about wages and benefits. He talks about this often. It's about the right to have a life. People don't only care about work. People work as a means to have their lives, to spend time with their family, to have the freedom to make choices. And when we have bad jobs, when we don't have control over our schedules, when our wages are too low, we don't actually have the ability to be full humans. And I think the direction of the UAW is saying, we are organizing humans. We're organizing workers who have families, who have spouses, who have children and we and communities, and we wanna see all of those people and things thrive. All right. So, in, but what you're talking about is, I mean, is, is an expansion of like what what constitutes the material benefits that a union can provide for its workers, right? But when we start talking about weighing in on a ceasefire, and this isn't this, and we should we should be clear, the the UAW has a history of engaging in these type of political questions. So this isn't um, this is, if anything, a return to the mean as opposed to anything else. But what are the implications of that? Right. I mean, the the material um, the material uh, existence of a worker in uh, in in Michigan or Ohio working at a car uh, manufacturer is not really going to be implicated materially by what goes on as to whether there's a ceasefire or not. So, I mean, I. What's the theory behind this or what is what's the impetus behind it? Well, first, you know, I have to disagree that people won't be impacted materially. I think they're impacted in two ways. And it's interesting that the first state you said was Michigan, because obviously the UAW is very strong in Michigan, not as strong as it once was. But there is a huge population of Arab auto workers in Michigan and Dearborn and Hamtramck outside of Detroit. There has been for a long time. And there's been a history of Arab workers standing up to their union and saying, you need to be on the right side of the Israel-Palestine war conflict, whatever you want to refer to it as. Um, And in the 1970s, uh, there was a wildcat strike about this very issue, about the UAW um, investing in Israeli bonds. Um, And so I think there are workers who are impacted by what's going on in Gaza because that's where they're from. That's where their family is from. That's where they still are. Um, And then in a less, you know, material way, but still, I think, really important and powerful is that a worker in Palestine and a worker in the United States, we all have the same desires, which is to have a life. And that just goes back to what I was saying earlier about the way Sean Payne is um, leading the union. And then, of course, there is the issue of how the U.S. is spending their money. Are they spending it on improving the lives of the working class here? No, they're spending it on supporting the death of six or 7,000 innocent children across the world. And I think any person um, can be against that. And and is against that. And we've seen in polling that the vast majority of voters support a ceasefire. And obviously it's not everyone. And I think it is, um, you know, a, a big, a big step. And it is, you know, in direct conflict with what the AFL-CIO said for the UAW to come out and say this. It's, it's brave, um, but it's important and it's necessary. And it's also good to note that the UAW is not the only union who has called for a ceasefire. The American Postal Workers Union has called for a ceasefire. The National Nurses Union, the International Union of Painters and Allied Trades, uh, the United Electrical Workers, and then you know many local unions, including the Chicago Teachers Unions. They are all the Chicago Teachers Union. Sorry, they are all they've all called for a ceasefire. So I think you know that is what solidarity is. You know, I was watching the live stream 
of the hunger strike in front of the White House last week. And uh, that's when the announcement of um, the UAW support was uh, shared. And um, Cynthia Nixon, obviously, we know her from Sex and the City and running for mayor of New York. She spoke about being a 45-year um, union member, and she said, unions are about the little guy standing up to the big guy, the person who has more resources and more power, and it's all about solidarity. And, like, Palestine in this situation is the little guy, and it's our obligation as working people to stand with them. And I, I personally find it very moving. You mentioned uh, Chicago Teachers Union, and um, I think in, in many respects, um, a lot of people peg that uh, the strikes that they had, I think it was now, you know, 10, 12 years ago, um, as sort of the beginning of this era of, of, of unionization. One of the things, too, that Karen Lewis, Lay Karen Lewis, who is the, uh, uh, the head of that union, um, would talk about, and this was... Um, this was most prominent, it seemed like that time, within teachers' union is this idea of social justice unionism as opposed to uh, managerial uh, unionism. And uh, it is one thing, you know, for the teachers and for nurses uh, to, to do this because they have a, a direct relationship with uh, their clients, if you will, right? I mean, you're a teacher, you're talking to your students, you're talking to the parents every day, you're a nurse, you're talking to uh, the, your, your, your patients, you're talking to their families. And this idea of adopting the, the fight for issues that may be of interest to the community, but not a direct interest to your job as a union, theoretically, it expands the sort of the, is, are we seeing that now uh, uh, sort of like develop more union, uh, I guess, uh, uh, throughout unions, outside of those sort of like uh, specific uh, sectors? And how much does uh, Fane's call for unions to time their contracts around May 1st, 2028, how much does that uh, also implicate it in that, in that shift? Yeah, I think the idea of bargaining for the common good, like what you're talking about, it's not just for the workers themselves, their wages and benefits, it's for the entire community, is amazing and beautiful. And I think it's, we're seeing it more and more. It's still, you know, not, I think, totally ubiquitous. Um, but I think the timing of the contracts is really huge, really exciting. I mean, it would be amazing to see so many workers out on strike on May Day uh, in 2028. I also think, you know, we need to be a little bit honest that union density in this country is 10%. Uh, it's very, very low. And we don't have a lot of power and our power is growing. Um, and people like Sean Fain are really invested in growing union density, growing our movement. But it's very difficult in a country with the labor laws that we have and how powerless workers are. So I think I think we need to be very sober how how we're looking at this while also being excited and optimistic about um, new union fights, new campaigns, new contracts, new ways of organizing people. Yeah, Mindy, could you just put this particular topic or, you know, the UAW weighing in on a ceasefire here within the context of other times that the UAW as one of the, you know, the United States' most prominent unions has weighed in historically on things like apartheid in South Africa and other, you know, international moments that required that kind of solidarity? Yeah, I mean, there is a history of the UAW, um, you know, being opposed to South African apartheid and being opposed to the Vietnam War and honestly taking unpopular positions. Um, so this isn't totally new, but I think that, um, you know, in the last, um, in the, maybe the last few decades, uh, the union had kind of taken a different tone and been sort of less political and more like, um, you know, have a nicer relationship with the employer, especially after like, you know, the 2008 economic crash. Um, so I think it's, it's really nice to see um, the UAW getting back to these kinds of roots where they have opposed, um, you know, World War One and uh, the Vietnam War and things like that. 
Uh, lastly, the um, this this push by Fain to unionize 150,000 new workers. I mean, do we yet have a sense of how that campaign is going to be rolled out, what it's going to involve? Do I mean, I imagine it's not something that they're going to broadcast in terms of where they're first going to go. But do we have any uh, uh, any ideas? Yeah, so I don't quote me on this, this isn't exactly it, but I think they have um, the ability, any auto worker in this country who's non-union has the ability to sign um, an online card right now. Um, so I think if you go to the UAW website, it will be clear how you can do that to express your support for unionizing. Um, and then um, when shops like different factories get to a certain percentage of support, um, the union will go public with this, the campaign at this specific shop. So let's say like the Tesla shop in Northern California, I don't know actually where it is. If they get to 50% of support on cards, there will be a big rally at the factory to announce their campaign with Sean Fain and workers and community members and politicians and whoever else. And then when they get to 70% support, they will ask for voluntary recognition from the employer. And then if they get denied, they will go to a union election. So the goal is to, I think, quietly build support. Once they get to a majority, go very public in a huge way, like, you know, big rally. And then um, when they get to a super majority of 70%, that's when they will... Um, they will ask for union recognition. So I've never seen anything like this at this scale. I think it's very cool. I'm, I'm really excited. Is there a, I mean, I'm just curious, is there a, um, I mean, I certainly understand why you keep it quiet, right? At least till you get 50%, but is there a reason why, like, I mean, is there, uh, is there a strategy behind the idea of 50% as opposed to let's say 60%? I mean, do organizers have a sense of like, um, if we get to 51%, and we bring in uh, more resources, it becomes more of a fair fight relative to what we know management's going to want to do to quash uh, that union. And then they they don't feel comfortable, you know, going full on and having a vote or at least pressing for a vote um, until we're at 70 percent. How do those numbers get generated or is that just something, you know, experience that that, that organizers have? Yeah, so to file for a union election, you need 30% of eligible workers on union authorization cards. But obviously, 30% doesn't win a union right. vote. And then you have to, you know, account for drop off because of the boss fight, which is very much legal in this country. And it's very much lethal. It works very, very well, unfortunately. Um, so 50%, I mean, that's, that's a majority. That's a great number. And I think that's enough to show, again, I'm not in Sean Fain's head. I don't work for the UAW, but that's enough to show that, hey, we have majority support. You can look, you can turn to any of your coworkers and they're probably with the union and you should be too. And then when you get to 70%, I mean, that's, that's a huge number that I think the union would feel safe saying we want voluntary recognition. And then if they don't get it, feel safe going to an election because even if there's drop off, they'll still win. And I think it's one of those things that builds on itself. If you look, if you've been on the fence because you're afraid or you had a negative union experience in the past or whatever it is, if you look around and you see 70% of your coworkers support this, including like people who have been there for a long time, people you respect, people who are very good at their jobs, people who are natural leaders, you're going to say, okay, I'm on board too. Mindy Eiser, labor writer based in Philadelphia. Thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. We'll put a link uh, to your piece in these times um, at uh, majority.fm and the podcast and YouTube description. Thanks again. Thanks for having me. Thank you.